Hello, everyone. Um, we will have uh, uh, Frank Willem's talk now, but afterwards there is a poster session. And I just wanted to announce that the, the poster session will be just outside uh, uh, the room uh, on the wall, basically uh, facing uh, yeah, the back of this corridor. And uh, it's just in here. You may have noticed it, but in case you haven't, I wanted to announce it. Good. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, it's, uh, do people hear me? Okay, very good. I'm actually probably, the only wrong thing is that I could be too loud. So um, this is a picture of uh, Unich, which has a water feature, which is kind of exponentially less beautiful than here. So I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about controlling microwave qubits and maybe in the end a bit of optomechanics even though I probably don't have time, let's just see. And uh, the clicker used to work. It doesn't work anymore, but that's fine. I don't have animations. Well, the presentation is completely frozen. <laughs> that is not so good. <laughs> Actually, the computer seems to be completely frozen. No. <laughs> I'm just stopping to screen share. And now I am screen sharing again. Making a fool out of yourself uh, by applying technology is still a very popular discipline. Um, okay, very good. So I, I would also like to thank the organizers for tolerating an off-topic talk. So I got this wonderful in, uh, invitation and when Joachim asked me, will you come or not, I told him, thanks for inviting me. About the topic of the conference, I have nothing to say. Um, but uh, he felt that this would be um, uh, still interesting. However, if the talk is badly given, he's not to be blamed for it, and it's completely on me. So I will talk a little bit, kind of give a ramp. I think half of the room probably has heard my intro to optimal control for superconducting qubits a few times. For the others, there will be a refresher. And then I will talk about a key ingredient for this, which is system identification by Bayesian learning also known as spectroscopy on steroids, and then how with both things together, you can actually make calibrating your qubits a lot faster and more efficient and more precise, which specifically is important when you scale up. So what's the goal of gate designs? Well, here is a, a chip. Somehow this is still one of the sexiest pictures of a transmon chip uh, 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 that you can use. Uh, we have some control electronics, and then we really want to make the gates in the quantum circuit with, high, with very high accuracy. And uh, we want to make them fast, because uh, at least for the completely Markovian, the completely white part of the noise, the best strategy for avoiding decoherence is basically to run away from it. Uh, secondly, you want to minimize gate error from all kinds of other sources. So, for example, from being not at the optimal working point, from unitary errors, from spurious degrees of freedom that are itself very uh, coherent, but still that it uh, perturb your system. And you want to make this work under realistic conditions. And ideally, you know, we know about a lot of intuitive recipes uh, for this, like Rabi oscillations and various refinements. But ideally, the, the time dependent Schrodinger equation gives you so many degrees of freedom that you would like to use some systematic mathematics to this. And specifically, as already mentioned, when you scale up uh, the time it takes you to calibrate a quantum processor with more than 10 qubits is significant. And uh, if you went to uh, John Martinez's talks when he was still at Google, he showed you these giant pictures which were never published. We have it as a photograph from a conference with a, a directed acyclic graph with about 40 nodes and an average uh, labor input of 0 0.5 PhD thesis per node to make this happen. And this is very impressive, but I think uh, this complexity also shows you that maybe the method should be rethought, because what he did is he took all the experimental knowledge, which of course is immense in this area, and programmed it better, but maybe uh, we should do it with less intuition if you want. Now, as kind of, you know, I talked about something old to just set the stage. Uh, this is uh, for situations when we have a lot of spectral crowding and it's interesting because it works and it helps us to understand why generalizations usually don't work. This is the drag method, which probably half of the room has a, by now a subroutine in their control electronics to do it. Um, 
And it's basically based uh, um, on the evolution of qubits, uh, say the first uh, roughly 10 years, when by becoming more and more modern um, from Kupler pair box, flux qubit, quantronium uh, to um, uh, transmod, we had very good reasons to become less and less nonlinear, so to make systems that are basically weakly unharmonic uh, oscillators. And um, the problem you have is that if you have a weak nonlinearity, uh, you get spectral crosstalk when you drive zero to one. Uh, your uh, one to two transition is not so far detuned. You start driving this, and you can prove that a driven harmonic oscillator um, has a semi-classical propagator. So then, essentially, all quantum dynamics breaks down. You can only do semi-classics. And this essentially limits uh, your bandwidth. This should be Tg to the minus one. Your gates need to be uh, spectrally narrower than this crosstalk, unless you do something clever. And it was shown in a uh, long time ago that uh, this is a typical hockey stick plot here, that if you have a long gate time, decoherence is eating you up. So you want to go shorter and shorter to beat white noise. Um, but at short gate times, you have a unitary problem because you're now you're probing your qubit at a bandwidth that encompasses the leakage transition and uh, that is limiting you. And of course, drag, which many of you know, uh, is the solution to this. Uh, we discovered this numerically and then we came up with various retroactive analytical uh, explanations. You still drive your system resonantly um, with cosine omega t times a, for example, Gaussian envelope, but then you drive a phase shifted uh, tone, uh, a phase shifted signal as well. And I think yesterday it was mentioned about IQ mixers. This actually happened when my graduate student uh, when my postdoc, uh, Jay Gambetta, told my graduate student, Felix Mozzoy, experimentalists have this thing called IQ mixers. We can shape U2 for free. And that was a long time ago. Um, but in any case, uh, when, you, uh, when this satisfies this differential equation, so it's proportional to the time derivative, you're actually suppressing leakage. And here you see plots from the same two groups that here, for example, show that without drag and with drag, you get a lot less error. This is the uh, fidelity um, of randomized benchmarking, which with drag uh, goes on pretty nice. And uh, if you have a second qubit that's nearby, you can make a slightly more complicated strategy where you, here you have drag, what is called U here is called omega there, um, and you need a, a Gaussian pulse shape with an additional modulation to make this work. But what, and this also works pretty well, here you see that this strategy, which we call WAWA, reduces the error. But what these strategies have in common is the workflow for experimentalists. They are very simple. Here is the nonlinearity, and here are things that essentially you can take this as an exp in, uh, inspiration, take this on the control qubit of your experiment, fiddle around until it works, and then it works, because these are pulses that have a very low complexity. Now, um, here is a result from numerical optimal control that looks kind of at wah-wah on steroids. So what are we doing if we have two qubits that are very weakly coupled and that happen to have a frequency collision? So two frequencies are the same. For example, the frequency of uh, qubit zero one uh, of qubit A and qubit B have the same transition frequency. And then you're basically kind of stuck. But you can come up with optimal control pulse shapes, which have a monochromatic carrier and then a rather complex envelope, which still allow you to do something. This is the pulse shape for a C0, and you know, it's complicated, that's the only message. And even idling is complicated. And think about this, IBM um, is, has fixed frequency qubits with fixed coupling, and because these frequency collisions can happen because fabrication is never completely precise, they have this heavy hexagon architecture with relatively low connectivity to make sure the risk is relatively low. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could use these pulse shapes uh, to do this? Now, this is an extreme example, but you see from comparing this slide and the slide before what the problem is, this is very hard to calibrate on your experimental toolkit. We don't understand why it looks like this. It is based on having a good model. So um, this is why we need to think a little bit about models. Now here's a bit of a technical slide, but let's make it kind of not too brutal. Uh, what we would like to do is, uh, I forgot the integral, and every time I show this slide, I need to remember I need to put an integral there. 
We want to have the, so there's an integral that goes here. We want to have the time evolution operator of the time dependent Schrodinger equation to do what it's supposed to do. We have a Hamiltonian which has a drift, the untunable terms, which has external fields. And we can essentially use a gradient base, a gradient on the pulse shape, which we can compute in closed form, um, to minimize the gate error. And that tells us how we have to update these external control fields to make it to do what we want. And if we do this, we get something complicated. And the first problem is that uh, we assume that this is actually known. And of course, historically, this was introduced for NMR and then used in atomic physics, where we do know the Hamiltonian pretty well because we have precision spectroscopy. But in our case, every qubit is different, so we have to do something else. So A, these parameters are all unknown, and B, there is degrees of freedom, H junk, that basically um, are also sitting there and you, you don't quite know. And those can include uh, fabrication uncertainty, that uh, for example, you know, you have a slightly different qubit to bus coupling, that can include the transfer function from your signal generator to your qubit, uh, which is also tricky to measure because if you, you, if you would like to measure it with the qubit itself because keep in mind in quantum computing we want four nines precision in the end of the day. And one way how you can solve this in superconducting qubits um, is, uh, has been done by the Yale group and it's my computer now stuck again. Uh, it is, uh, that is embarrassing. Um, and now it seems to be totally stuck. No, I can do something. Um, no, I can even move this, okay. It's working again. I shouldn't press the button to, so often. It's uh, maybe commenting on my nervousness. So um, the Yale group has shown that you can actually do this numerically. For example, in a 3D transmon, which A, is a very, very clean system, and B, in most of their work, uh, they are looking at still relatively long pulses, like 500 nanoseconds, which means they need a good model and a relatively limited bandwidth. So for really going fast, um, this is a good starting point, but it's not the end of the story. So uh, what you can do, and I will soon come to new stuff, is basically to take what I've just explained to you. You design your system, you characterize it, you do this open loop gradient search, and then do a closed loop calibration where you measure fidelity by randomized benchmarking, and then you're readjusting the pulses a bit like a person on a mixing desk, dear ICTP, this is a public domain picture, we can show it and um, uh, fine tune the pulse. And this works, it can be done, and uh, we published this a couple of years ago and some labs use it. But the problem is it's cumbersome, it takes a long time, so you want to avoid it as much as possible, you want to have a good model for this. So now we essentially need to think how can we do extremely good spectroscopy, how can we do a model that is good enough to get us to four nines. And uh, here is a starting point. This is also a bit of old work. I just moved, so you know my papers are all a bit old. Um, and this is called system identification. And it's based on Bayes' theorem. Who of you knows what Bayesian probability is? That is uh, more than half of the room. Brilliant. Um, so this is a repeat. Um, basically, um, Bayesian uh, probability is an interpretation of the concept of probability that is complementary to Laplace's interpretation. And there is a lot of kind of sectarian discussions among the probability theorists, which you can safely ignore. Um, but basically, it interprets um, a probability as your degree of knowledge. And the weather report of uh, Trieste is a good example for this, because a frequentist, where you need to repeat everything a lot of time, for this, the probability of precipitation of 15% makes no sense. It basically just tells you we know enough about the weather of today that um, in kind of 15% of the days where we had the same data, it rained. But as the day progresses, this gets updated because we learn more about what's going on. So this probability becomes adjusted and the confidence for this probability also becomes bigger. And uh, this is all based on Bayes' theorem, which is written here. It's elementary to prove by joint probabilities. Um, and it's made out of weird symbols. So what this means is x is um, a parameter that you would like to measure. d is data that you have taken, for example, the observation of the weather up to now. And x is, does it rain today? 
and the probability of x given d is proportional to the probability of d given x times the prior knowledge, the probability of x. So for us in quantum mechanics, d given x basically goes as follows. We can you know, use quantum state and, uh, pro and postulates of quantum mechanics to predict the outcome of a measurement, which in a non-degenerate case is the overlap with state n. And if now our state psi parametrically depends on x, x is, for example, something in your Schrodinger equation, then um, the probability of a Pn, um, given that x is somehow contained in psi, uh, is P of n given x, and n is an example of data. So, um, and this tells us, and so by, by the rules of quantum mechanics, we can compute this. And then when we measure something, we can opt out our knowledge. If we measure something that is already likely, it confirms our probability. If we measure something that's unlikely, maybe we have to change our probability a lot. And um, this is called the likelihood. This is called the prior of what we knew before. This is the posterior of what we knew afterwards. And in some work that back then was mostly going for a theoretical audience, but I think it's time to, you know, we've now used it in more advanced tools and it's um, time to wake it up. This, uh, we've probably realized that this goes into feedback algorithm. You know, you um, optimize some measurement settings, you measure, you update, you get a new likelihood. And um, after you've done one experiment, you feed this in as a prior to your next experiment and you repeat. And here is an example, namely swap spectroscopy. Chevron patterns, which in many cases is one step of tune-up. So we have a qubit. Here we assume it's frequency tunable. We have a resonator of an unknown frequency that can be a resonator you made, or that can be a two-level system, a two-level resonance that you would like to understand better. And if you hit the resonance, then you get a coherent oscillation with a large amplitude and the coupling strength G is given by the frequency here. And um, this has a few features. For example, when you realize you are here, you should really do something. You should stop taking data. Uh, you rather want to measure close to there at the areas of high contrast. And actually, when you take this probability and you just simulate doing one shot of an experiment, so you take a dither, um, this is like old newspapers, you see that even though this is very resol low resolution and it has a lot of noise on top of it, you can make out uh, the figure. You can see what's going on. So what we came up with in a paper uh, already a while ago was a method uh, that has a measurement schedule like this. All of these points are one attempt to a quantum measurement. So click or no click. Yes, I know that for current uh, control electronics, this is impractical. This is a very theoretical paper. Um, and then you move on. And let me explain this a bit more on the next slide. Uh, so first of all, how this goes is that uh, you update your prior and your posterior. And for example, every now and then, you're choosing a different setting of various parameters. Uh, let's not go into this too much detail. Let's rather focus on the next slide. So this is, again, swap spectroscopy. And the idea here is as following. Initially, we know that we have this resonator somewhere. We have a vague idea of the frequency band. We have a vague idea of the coupling strength that's our initial prior. And then we take about 15 data points, essentially randomly. So we go on a random fishing expedition. So our prior by base update gets a little bit narrower. And then after this, we do the following. We look at what is currently at step n, my guess for the resonance frequency. So, or my guess for the detuning. And then we go to zero detuning. So for what currently is my best guess for detuning, we also use uh, our guess for the coupling strength, and then we do adaptive interferometry. We also check what is the standard deviation of the coupling strength, and then we want to go far enough out so the phase difference, if we go out here, which is essentially k times the frequency difference, if we go by k oscillations, uh, it gets larger, so if we want to resolve a tiny frequency difference, we better have a large k. But given that we know also the standard deviation of, uh, of sigma, uh, this should be delta g, actually. 
um, that um, we also know the standard deviation, so we should not go too far out, otherwise we could actually miscount the number of oscillations. And this allows us to basically step out here relatively quickly, and you see that with no noise in about 150 uh, measurement shots, you would go to extremely low error. Now this is, uh, has a lot of assumptions. You see these are occurs with noise and then it's not so good. But still this shows us that in principle, very data economically, we can uh, characterize our system. And uh, for us, we can also do this, for example, for finding two-level systems. Here is a situation with two two-level systems where we can even test various hypotheses so we can also count them and figure out how many of those do we need that our data is satisfactorily described. There's this statement by George Box, a statistician, that uh, all models are wrong but some are useful. So here the idea is to count as many two-level resonators as we have that we get high precision, but not all of them that are on our chip if they're extremely widely tuned. And here you see there is scenarios like, for example, ND equals two means we have two of these resonators. P1, P means uh, we're checking that we have at least one and that converges quickly. But if we would say we don't have more than one, then the probability after a couple of measurement shots would go down. So we can also you know, uh, count things. So this is kind of fitting on steroids. And we have taken this tool together with optimal control and kind of came up with the following uh, circular process. We start with an initial model, something we have designed, and um, we um, use this model to, we do some initial characterization, very simple, to find a good set of pulses. Then we construct gate sequences and we evaluate those pulses with the optimal control methods from the first part of the talk. Uh, first with models, then without model, uh, then model free. And um, after this, we check now that we have learned something from our calibration, how do we have to update our model? Are our calibration data telling us that we have some extra resonators, that we have parameters that were slightly wrong? And with this, we are updating our database. So when we calibrate next time, we don't have to do it all over again. Uh, we have uh, taken this with a number of really smart software developers and tools like TensorFlow and programmed this in an AI framework of automatic differentiation. And there's now two branches of this. Uh, we test this with various of our friends, but we've also started a company, well, the name used to be there, but the layout is not great. It's called Cruise, uh, like Cruise Control for Quantum Computing starts with a Q. It's cruise.eu. Um, so how does that look like? Let's go back to an example from the beginning of the talk. This was an experiment with was one of the last things Stefan, Stefan Philipp did before he left IBM. We went back to drag. You know, once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, of course. So um, drag, this rule of the derivative, is the first order of a long perturbation series, but the higher orders become more and more sensitive to details of your Hamiltonian. Because you can start asking, you decouple from the third level, but what about the fourth and the fifth? And these are all legitimate questions, so you shouldn't push your precision of your calculation more than your model. So we applied those tools, and we were able to show the following. Um, we uh, go from an initial drag pulse, the blue line, this is a Gaussian, the time derivative, discretized, this is a derivative of a Gaussian. And when we ran it, and we got a kind of a decent uh, error, this is the population of the leakage state, but at about 100 gates, uh, the gate became bad, gate became bad. But then we ran this through this machinery of simultaneous numerical optimal control and system identification. The pulses got better, so this is a much um, uh, um, uh, bigger, um, uh, a much lower re uh, reduction of the quality. Uh, the pulses became less intuitive. Now there's this extra bump in here and the derivative looks all over the place and it's not the derivative anymore precisely. But they worked really well. So um, these are drag results and you see that as you get shorter and shorter, you kind of get a reasonably sharp curve 
because drag, remember, d drag doesn't help you beat the Nyquist theorem. Drag doesn't help you to beat the bandwidth limit. It just helps you to go right up to the bandwidth limit, and rather than having to stay in order of magnitude above it. And we saw that with our pulses, these are piecewise constant, um, that uh, we could go all the way with not really a systematic trend, you know, this is a little bit worse, but this is better again, until a sharp time. And we were kind of proud of this, that we understood the quantum part so well that we identified the time at which the microwave signal amplitude was so high that the input cable was starting to make problems. It became unlinear, a nonlinear in an unpleasant way. So we discovered kind of a unexpected limitation to this. So this is a very simple setting, but it encourages that this method may be useful. Here is a synthetic example where we essentially run a numerical simulation of a system and we uh, do a full model matching. So uh, we are using what is called a model matching score, which is essentially a type of a standard deviation. And we, are, we have a black box model that includes a relatively complete model of, in this case, uh, two coupled transmons. And we can model them as uncoupled duffing oscillators. This must be clearly wrong. Uh, we can add coupling, but we can also take all the bells and whistles be below the duffing oscillators. And we see that uh, the standard deviation gets stuck for all models besides the full one. So this validation on synthetic data tells us that we can actually find out um, that this uh, coupled duffing oscillators model is incomplete. And um, you can also do this. This is more simulating a full tune-up. So here we have the resonance frequency of transmon A, transmon B, the nonlinearities uh, non of transmon A, transmon B, the coupling strength, um, a parameter of the transfer function, the fridge temperature, and the, exi uh, the excitation and relaxation rates. And basically, you're not doing anything you couldn't do by hand, but you're doing it all at the same time at about 150 iterations, so you realize that if you initialize by thermalization, you know, your, fr your fridge temperature was slightly wrong, you thought it was 55, but it was really 50. So it at least shows that it's data efficient, and we cost now try to uh, do this with a lot more systems. And I will probably actually not talk about the wee bit of optomechanics, because that is a big change. My group has started to do optomechanics, and we're happy to discuss about this. So I hope I could convince you that the optimal control that we have been working on 15 years has been coming of age in the sense that uh, after being mostly theoretically or quite a simple systems, it can be applied. And that the calibration problem of quantum computers, even if you're not going to fancy pulses, can be addressed if you combine this with the right AI tools. With that, thank you very much uh, for your attention. So thank you, Frau Willem, and uh, questions, please. Um, do you have a sense or results on how, how does the computational complexity or the algorithmic complexity scale with the number of qubits if you're trying to do this Hamiltonian learning? So um, it is all based on the assumption that if we have a large quantum processor, we can at some point tile it into tiles that are overlapping but if they're not overlapping, they're independent of each other. If that doesn't hold, quantum computing and superconducting qubits is probably a dead end. And uh, within this, we have not done any systematic scaling. Uh, worst case, it is exponentially hard, but limited by the size of those tiles. Um, however, uh, given that we don't want infinite precision, arguments like this degree of freedom can be neglected because it's far detuned still hold. The practical computational effort is that my startup package was medium generous, and this is, we can run a lot of these things on our uh, cluster at the same time. You know, it's, I mean, ultimately it's exponentially hard, but with those assumptions, I think it's, uh, it's manageable. So, um, thank you for a very nice overview and a great talk. Um, so, 
often in these systems, there's the assumption that there's some sort of static, although noisy, uh, reality that you need to uh, somehow learn and then you can react to. But uh, we see that some subtle aspects of our systems have uh, 1 over f drift, which is non-stationary on the time scales that you're trying to mm -hmm. calibrate. So w what are your thoughts uh, regarding this uh, ultimately? Mm -hmm. I think people who use cloud quantum computers actually know at which point of the day the thing is calibrated and try to send their jobs then. Um, so um, I practically you need to recalibrate during the day uh, because things drift in between days. And the goal here, which we make progress towards, but you know, there's no last word, is that once you have run this a couple of times, your modeling and your database of calibration results is uh, large enough so small adjustments um, can be made quickly. You don't need to make a full bring up. Now, of course, with true 1 over F noise, you have the occasional catastrophic jump which you're powerless against, but if it's localized, um, you can at least kind of reduce the pain, but you cannot uh, remove the problem. I can say one thing about this strategy. A young master student of mine explained to me that he had this absolutely brilliant method with uh, two pi over half pulses separated by a break to measure T2, which he had found with this method. And I congratulated him that he was way too late to get his Nobel Prize. Norman Ramsey already had it. <laughs> um, but this tells you, you know, this is also kind of fun, um, uh, uh, that this actually works. And if people just haven't you know, read the relevant papers, uh, yeah. Just a quick question on the slide 20. I think this is the next slide. You had the um, fidelity of three nines about. Um, it's a flat line uh, mm -hmm. with the beyond drag thing. Why is it flat? Why, is it, why isn't it getting better when you make the pulse shorter? Because the T1 limit is, is that the T1 limit, like four nines, four and a half? Yes, nines? so this is the T1 limit. So this is already in the area where you're limited by adjacent levels. Um, and um, the sample came out like this, you know, it was not a Unimon. <laughs> and um, um, we simply could, you know, this is a typical hockey stick that at some point, when you're clearly running out of bandwidth, uh, you have, and you're doing optimal control, you get the sharp wall rather than a gradual transition, and you could simply push closer to the sharp wall. Well, I was just surprised that the red dots are really flat. I mean, I would have assumed that they somehow there's some tilt. But you know, we didn't reach the quantum speed limit, and okay. T1 was so long because you see we are significantly worse than the T1 limit that uh, you would have to go kind of, you know, to the C to actually see T1 effects. So it was a very clean um, uh, qubit noise-wise, but not a qubit with a cl uh, very clean spectrum. And I think uh, as one comment that should have made it on the slides, the idea that in a experiment that has no obvious flaw, you could get an error budget, uh, we think is very appealing. You know, once you have an experiment with no obvious flaw, it makes errors. You want to know where is my residual errors coming from. And to my understanding, it's hardly published. Um, and to my understanding, this is also extremely difficult. And this is something we hope to, to achieve with this. Okay, good. So uh, since there are no more questions, then let's thank uh, Frank Willem again. Sure. So there is a coffee break now, if I understand correctly. And uh, uh, please.